Once again, we are going to be working our way through Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 26. But before we can dive into those verses, we must do what we always do, back up, discuss what we talked about two weeks ago, so that we keep everything in its proper context. Now, two weeks ago, we made our way through Philippians 1, verses 16 through 20. Now, we know by now that Paul is writing to the church in Philippi from prison in Rome. And why is Paul in prison in Rome? For preaching the gospel. That's why Paul is there. See, there's something that the church in Philippi is going to learn from Paul, and they have been learning from Paul, but there's also this writing that we too should be learning from Paul, and this is what it means to be a mature believer in Christ. Paul wasn't going to stop preaching the word because he's in prison. Paul isn't going to stop preaching the word because stones are being bounced off his skull. Paul has been beaten numerous times. He has very powerful men constantly going after him. And what does Paul do? The only thing he knows to do is tell others about Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because it's the best news a single person can hear. To to know that you were once enslaved to sin, but because of what Christ has done by going to the cross. But not only going to the cross, He took every believer's sin on the cross with Him while God's wrath was being poured out upon Him. And what did that do? That day, 2,000 years ago, freed every single believer, clothed them in the righteousness of Christ when their faith is placed in Him and Him alone. That's why Paul can't be quiet about this. And he won't. He will not be silent. So here he is from prison, and he's writing this letter to the church in Philippi. Now, we know the main reason why he's writing this letter to them is he's thanking them for their prayers, but also for their financial support in his missionary work. But he's also warning them. He's also warning them that there are preachers out there that are speaking ill of Paul. And Paul is is correcting them. And why are they speaking ill of Paul? Because they're envious of him. Paul is known in the Christian community. He is the apostle who is planting the Gentile churches. He is the one who is writing the majority of the New Testament. This holy inspired word. And it's really sad that you have these preachers who are envious of him. They're not praying for him. They're jealous of him. So they're they're speaking ill, and we're not certain what they were saying about him. Paul doesn't let us know. But Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, correcting them, letting them know that they're saying these things, and they are not true. But I want you to look at the maturity of Paul, because in the flesh, what do you want to do to someone who is slandering your name? You you want to go after them, I'm I'm assuming. I I know I would want to. You you would want to make them pay for what they have said about you. And, And here Paul is in prison, and he's correcting what's being said. But look at what he says here. This is... This is so difficult, and yet this is one of the reasons why, as believers, we need to look to the Word as our truth and not rely upon our feelings and emotions. Look at verse 18. I know what you're saying. Britt, we've already gone over this. Yeah, that's true, but, but it's important we, we look at it again. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So these very preachers, these teachers who are speaking ill of Paul, the one thing that they are doing correctly is preaching the word. And what does Paul say? I rejoice in that. God hates their motive and how they're speaking ill of Paul, but he will use the truth to regenerate the hearts of his children. Guys, this is is spiritual maturity here. 
This is what we are learning from Paul, and this is something that we should meditate on. What does it look like to be a mature believer? Well, how do you know what that looks like? Well, you have to go to the Word. You have to study it. And that's part of maturing in the faith. But we had this example in Paul. Paul then shares something else with the church. The, the church understands... They know why Paul has been arrested for for preaching the good news. But they also know that Paul is going to have to stand before Caesar. He's going to be put on trial. And it's a beautiful thing that Paul says here. The church in Philippi is going to gain confidence from this. But we as believers today should gain confidence from hearing what is said here. Paul knows that when he stands before Caesar and those powerful men... He knows that he is going to be able to share the word. And he's not going to be ashamed of it. He has confidence in that. And where does that confidence come from? One, the people, the believers praying for Paul while he is imprisoned. The the Philippians are praying for Paul. But Paul also is sharing that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within him. And, And there is a power that comes by way of the Holy Spirit. And when it comes to that power, it is going to, he is going to speak the truth Through you. I've heard this question many of times. And and I guarantee you, you all have heard the same question. I I don't know what I would do. This is the question that that I've heard and you've probably heard as well. I I don't know what I would do if I had to stand before a firing squad. And and they're, they're sitting there staring at you. And they say either you denounce Christ and you live... Or you proclaim Christ and you're going to die. You you sit there and you think, I I don't know if I have the strength to do that. I don't know if I could be like Stephen or be like Paul. Can can I answer that question for you? Yeah, you can be. Why? Because you have the same Holy Spirit dwelling within you that Stephen and Paul have. That's where Paul's confidence lies. It's not in and of himself. It's not in his credentials. I mean, Paul technically went to the MIT of seminary during his day, and we're going to get into that. But Paul isn't relying on that. Paul is relying on prayers and the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. So he is telling the church in Philippi, look, I know that when I stand before Caesar and those powerful men, do you know what I'm going to do? Regardless of the outcome, I'm going to share the word of God, the good news. This was life or death for Paul. So let's pause for a second here, okay? Life or death for Paul. We're we're going to see this throughout these verses. And now you need to ask yourself, oh church, is it life or death for you? Are you willing to proclaim the good news wherever you are or Are you ashamed of it because you're not certain of the outcome? Now listen, there's going to be times, there's going to be times where you are going to be ashamed and you're going to coward from the truth. And that is a sin. But oh believer, you have been forgiven of that sin. You can repent of that sin. But what I'm saying to you from here on out is I want you to remember these words of Paul when these situations are in front of you because every one of us in here we're going to be placed in a situation where we have the ability to proclaim Christ it it could be to co-workers to friends to family members to enemies it it doesn't matter but know this you you too have the same confidence dwelling within you the same confidence that Paul has and once again it has nothing to do with you but with the one dwelling within you With the one who has regenerated your heart, that being God the Father. And with the one who has rescued you, that being our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's where your confidence lies. That's where that power comes from. Okay, so we're caught up. And we're going to move forward here. Let's look at Philippians 1 verse 21. Uh, Just so you guys know, I am trying to set a record for how many Sundays... We stay in the first chapter of a book. 
We're, we're getting close to breaking that record. If we can make it past 15 Sundays, we got a new goal to shoot for. Now let's look at verse 21, all right? For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If you mark in your Bible, just highlight this, underline it, whatever you do, put stars beside it, whatever you do, mark this. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What does Paul mean by this? Paul is saying that while the good Lord has given me air to breathe, while my lungs are still functioning, while my heart is still beating, while my brain is still thinking, do you know what I'm going to be doing? Proclaiming Christ, serving Christ telling others about the one and only Savior. That's what Paul was living for. That's, that's what Paul's life was all about. And, and you may be sitting here asking yourself, yeah, but, but, but he was an apostle. That's what he was called to do. Of course that's his life. Listen, church, because your heart has been regenerated by no doing of your own, but because of Christ, the one who rescued you, God, the Father, the one who put the plan into place, and the Holy Spirit who he sent to dwell with inside you. This is your calling as well. Your life should be dedicated to Christ. And you know what that's going to do? That's going to affect every single decision you make. Every part of your life is going to be geared towards serving Christ as a mature believer. The job you take, the people you hang out with, the politicians you vote for, every single aspect of your life is to be guided by this. Even the way you dress there's not a single, solitary, little speck of your life that, that shouldn't be guided by the Word of God. For to me, to live is Christ. That's what Paul is saying. That's the inspired Word of God. But if we're honest with ourselves, sadly, we don't live this way. We almost compartmentalize our, our, our Christian life. Okay, on Sundays, but between 9.30 and 12, I'm a holy roller. I am pure as the driven snow. When I walk into the church, the angels sing. But from 12.30 on, I live how I want to live. No longer do I look to the Word to direct me. No longer do I rely upon the Holy Spirit who is dwelling within me. On a Monday, if you were to be sitting across from many believers at lunch while they're talking to their friends you would think they were pagans. Do you understand how this changes everything? Paul was willing to give his life to preach the word. And even if he gave his life, what does he say? And to die is gain. Paul got it. While I'm here, I'm preaching Christ. And when God calls me home, I'm going to be worshiping him. I am going home. Sadly, for many of us, we think this is our home. Sadly, for believers, we, we tend to believe that, that this, this earth that, that has just been corrupted by sin, 
is your home. No, we're just passing through. But while we're here, we are to live for Christ. Paul is excited about being in the presence of God. He doesn't fear death. He's not consumed by it. He's not worried about what his friends and family members are going to think of him because he's proclaiming Christ. Remember, he's lost most of them by now anyway. Paul was a Jew, a very powerful Jew, a religious scholar. People looked up to him, and and then Jesus blinds him, brings him to the faith. Paul rejects what he once was teaching, what he once was doing, and that was persecuting Christians because now he is one. What, What do you think? He lost his job. He lost his friends. He lost his family members. Why? Because it was more important to him to preach Christ than to be light in this world. And for some of us, sadly, we got too tight a grip on this world. As if this world is our Savior, is our Redeemer. And it's not. This world is fallen. And it's getting darker and darker. But for some odd reason, the believers aren't being the light as they've been called to be. So here, Paul is even warned in the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts 21.13. This is Agabus. Agabus prophesied about Paul being arrested in Jerusalem. And and when the other believers heard about this, what did they try to do? They tried to convince Paul, don't go there. Don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go there preaching the word. Go elsewhere. But look at what Paul says in Acts 21.13. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Step back for a moment and just look at that verse. Look at that verse and just let it sink in. Where does that confidence come from? In Paul, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who is dwelling inside you. Did you see the power that is there? Yeah, you you can tell Paul all day long, you're going to prison. Or whenever you get to this certain area, they're going to crack rocks over your head. They're going to try and stone you to death. What does Paul do? Okay. Okay, first, I'm going to preach the word. And if it's my time for the Lord to call me home, then that is gain for me. So once again, we we need to ask ourselves, oh believers, is your life Christ? Or is it your job? Is your life Christ? Or is it yourself? Is your life Christ or is it sports? Look at verse 22. Still writing, he says, If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Now often, when we see the word flesh, especially in the New Testament, it's referring to sin. But Paul is not speaking of the word flesh here as sin what he's referring to that being flesh is his physical life on this earth and once again he's saying that this is an opportunity for me as long as i'm here the lord hasn't called me home yet this is what i'm going to be doing i'm going to be traveling i'm going to be planting churches in the gentile lands I'm going to be telling these pagans about Christ and Him crucified, about the one and only Jesus who saves. This is going to be fruitful labor for Him. Why? 
Because with Paul, the same with all of you who are believers in here, Christ has made him righteous and you righteous through his death, burial, and resurrection. And then through that righteousness, Paul is able to do good works. And through that righteousness, you, O oh believer, are able to do good works. You could not do them before. Apart from Christ, every time you helped a little old lady across the street carrying her groceries, that was out of your own sheer arrogance. It was a selfish act on your part. It wasn't pleasing to God. For it's when you become a believer, when your faith is placed in Christ, then those good works start pouring from you. And here's the thing. Even those good works were predetermined by God the Father, which is beautiful because that means, oh believer, that you are not going to miss a single good work that God has called you for. Look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, so think about that. Everything that you do for someone else as a believer, that is a good work that God, God has called you to do. Do you take credit for that? I surely hope not. I hope as believers that when we do a good work, we keep our mouth shut. We don't have to advertise it. I'm going to go back and check some Facebook posts later, some Instagram posts later, and see how many of us in here are posting about our good works. I'm just kidding. I, I'm not going to. I don't, I don't have an Instagram account. Um, but, but, but think about that. Well, why, do you, why, do you, why, do you, why do we advertise it? It's a work that God has called us to do. It should be pleasing to Him, and that should be enough. But, but for some odd reason, even believers, we, we want to announce everything that we do for other people. We tend to call it a humble brag. Yeah, I didn't have anything to do the other day, so uh, there's this... 94 year old lady down the street and her refrigerator was acting up on her so I went and moved it out for her got her another one and brought it in and whoo it took a long time it was about three and a half hours of work there well guess what it's no longer a good work why because you're boasting in it humility is something the church needs to dive back into Again, this is something that a, a good work cannot be done apart from Christ. Look at Philippians 2.13. I know what you're thinking. We're going to be there in about eight weeks, so why, why are we jumping ahead? But Philippians 2.13, look at what it says. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That, that, that's beautiful, isn't it? Every good work that we do is pleasing to God, so keep your mouth shut about it. Because He knows. He knows. No, no, okay, let, let's, let's bounce back to Paul because he's going to be doing this fruitful labor as long as he has breath in his lungs and those good works are, are going to be pleasing to the Lord as he's going around to these pagan lands and, and preaching the good news. But remember, he's also talking about life and death, which is going to come by way of preaching the gospel. As long as he is alive, he's going to preach the word. He's going to preach the word until death, until he is martyred for preaching the word. Which is why he says here in verse 22, Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. Now what does Paul mean by this? Paul doesn't know the will of God here. But what Paul does understand is God the Father. And he knows that as long as he is walking this earth, he's going to be preaching and teaching the word. Paul wants to continue planting churches, developing disciples, raising up young pastors. But, but he's also ready to be with the Lord. 
Yet he knows that what's going to take place is in the hands of God because it's already been predetermined. Which is why we see this struggle. Paul wants to be here preaching the word of God, but Paul also wants to be home worshiping God the Father and the Son. And and we see this in verse 23. He says, "I I am hard pressed between the two. But Paul is letting the church in on this dilemma that he's having. Paul loves spreading the word, fellowshipping with his brothers and sisters in Christ. And yet, look at what he says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. This is something that every single believer needs to reflect on, to to ask themselves. Where would you rather be? Here on this earth or with your Lord and Savior? Now, that's not it's not an easy question because you have friends and family members. There's people here that you love and that you care for. But at the same time, do you you not want to go home where there is no sin, where there is no corruption, where there is no sickness? Do you not want to go home to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone before you to worship with them? But then that brings us back to while we're still here on this earth, do you not want your family and friends to hear the good news so that when the Lord calls them home or when the Lord ends their life, you know where they're going? So so yes, Paul is desiring to be home with his Savior, but while he's here, he's going to preach the word like there is no tomorrow because he is concerned about the souls of those who surround him. And we should be too. There's something else here in this verse that should bring us comfort. Because there's not a single person in here who hasn't lost a loved one. But but here's the good news with this. That loved one that, that, that you've lost, if they are a believer, man, they are in this place that even Paul himself could not describe when he was called up into the third heaven. He couldn't describe it because it is so beautiful. It is a place where the, where the body no longer aches, where sin no longer exists. It is a place of pure beauty. And and to know that, to know that that loved one of yours who who is a believer, that's where they are. Listen, if you even gave them an opportunity to come back to this earth and hang out with you, do you know what they would say? Nope. I mean, they love you, but, but they're experiencing a love there that you cannot even grasp. And if we could understand it, there's no way we would even want them back, not even for a day. And is that hard to say? Absolutely. Because you do, you have a love for that person. And it hurts and it aches because you, you can't see them and you can't be with them and you can't hear their voice and you just... You want to touch their face just one more time. But man, where they are now is far, far better than the hundred best days they had on this earth. 
And what I pray, what would I pray when we, we see this verse is that it brings us comfort. That it brings us joy and peace. Is it hard? Absolutely. It is devastating, but to know where they are. And, and, and for Paul to be able to write it out like he did. Through his divine words, I, I just pray that we see the comfort there. Continuing. Look at verse 24. Paul says, But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So Paul wants to go home. He, he wants to be with his Lord and Savior. That's what he wants to do. But, but he also has this understanding. And, and, and some people, they'll read this verse and they're like, well, that's pretty arrogant of Paul. You know, God's going to keep me here to keep you guys in line. That's how important I am. I'm Paul, the man, the apostle, the chosen one. But listen, that's not what Paul is saying here because Paul understands that it's a joy for him to be on this earth, to be able to teach and preach the word. Now remember where Paul is. Paul is writing this from prison, so, so Paul isn't living his so-called best life ever, Joel. That's not happening here. But here Paul is saying, I, I find joy in all of this. God, if you still have work for me to do on this earth, I'm going to enjoy every moment of it because my job is to preach you. To, to, to teach about the Redeemer, the Savior. So Paul isn't being arrogant here because Paul understands the only way he's able to do this, it's not because of himself. It's because God has regenerated his heart. He's removed that heart of stone and given him that heart of flesh so that he can go into the world and preach and teach. So Paul is stating, if I'm able to continue serving you, and that's what I've been called to do, and I'm going to do it joyfully. Now think about your walk for a moment. Think about your walk here on this earth. Remember, Paul's in prison, so you really can't take your life and compare it to Paul right now. But Paul finds joy even being in prison because he's able to write to the church. Do, do you find joy in telling others about your Savior? Do you? Because you're free to roam. Paul isn't. And yet he's saying, yeah, here I am, prison writing letters to the church in Philippi. And I find joy in that. So if Paul is able to continue serving, no matter where he is, it brings him joy. Now look at verse 25 here. It says, convinced of this. Now I don't believe... Y'all heard that also? Was that thunder? Okay, okay. Sun is shining, and then I hear this rumble, and we find joy in that. So, so verse 25, convinced of this. Again, I don't believe that this statement is a hint of direct revelation from God. For if it was, then I don't think Paul would have wrote in verse 22, which he says, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. So it's not as if God has given Paul a direct revelation here where he says, convinced of this. I believe that Paul is convinced due to his own personal conviction that his ministry here on this earth is not finished. 
For if this was a revelation from God, there would be no reason for Paul to write. He wasn't sure if he was going to live or die. He, he would know. But we know something else, too, through, through the writing to the church in Philippi, where this isn't a direct revelation. Paul knows that this mature church is still struggling in certain areas. Listen to me, listen to me. That this mature church is still struggling in certain areas. You know why we, we meet on Sundays and, and on Wednesday nights and, and we go verse by verse through the scripture? It's to educate the body on the word of God. For this is the only way in which we mature in the faith. And even mature churches don't have it all together. So, so understand that there's a reason why Scripture is so important. And when we fellowship with one another, you're not hearing personal stories. It's just about the Word of God. Why? Because that's how we mature as a church. Even, even the church in Philippi, even it struggled with humility. Look at Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Well, we're going to be getting there in six weeks. Um, Christ's example of humility. Look at what Paul writes here. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being on the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. The church in Philippi was struggling with this. And Paul was saying, we're, we're going to tap into it. But, but it wasn't just that. Paul is also preparing the church in this letter to battle false teachers. Look at what he says in Philippians 3, 17 through 18. Four or five months down the road. But look at verse 17. It says, brothers... Join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. See, it is so important for the believer to be able to use discernment. And where does that discernment come from? It comes from knowledge of the word of God. But also, the church in Philippi was struggling. They had people that were going against one another inside the body. Look at Philippians 4, 2 through 3. These names are beautiful. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. They're, they're, they're going at one another, and, and Paul is even writing to them and saying, this has got to stop. This bickering, it's crazy. You're not like the world. You shouldn't be at each other's throats. We are brothers and sisters in Christ Paul is also going to warn the church about being anxious. And man, I, if I can just be truthful, that's always something you want to hear from a teaching elder, right? If I can just be truthful here. Um, th th this, this, this hits home. Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So yes, the church in Philippi was a mature church, but even mature churches need to be reminded of the truth. Which is why, once again, we go verse by verse, because the Scripture covers everything that we need to know when it comes to pleasing God. The Scripture covers every single aspect of your life. 
Do I think it's wrong to do a topical sermon every now and then? No, absolutely not. I've done one in the past 10 years. But I'm not saying that's the only way to teach and preach. But what I am saying is the majority of the teaching and preaching needs to come from the word of God. Verse by verse. So I hope this helps us understand why Paul was convinced that his time with the church in Philippi wasn't done yet. Okay, we're going to we're going to stop right there. Um, so come back next week to make it all the way to verse 26 all right let's pray